Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today I will remember to add in the edit of the slap because I forgot. I straight up forgot and I was in a hurry so that was my bad but thank you guys for reminding me in the comments. Uh, also, we are doing something brand new that is probably going to... Most people are going to click off the video after a while but buckle in, bear with me because we're doing it for science. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's exactly for science. This is a talk given at the end of the Friday session at the convention, and I wanted to give one of the new governing body members, I think this guy is Gage Flegel, I, I could be wrong there, uh, I can't, I get them mixed up because they look kind of similar, but I wanted to give them a fair chance, and to my memory, and I might be wrong, I don't believe I have actually watched an entire talk by any of the two new bozos. So, for the sake of science, for the sake of entertainment, he, they might not be as exciting and spicy as some of the other governing body members that we've really come to know and be able to laugh at for some of their goofy mannerisms and things like that, but let's see if we can find some new jokes. You know, maybe we need to r put to rest the old Tony drinks too much and uh, elastic facelet. Maybe those jokes are kind of tired. David explain, you know, that's kind of 2015. Well, well, maybe we, that's almost 10 years old, guys. So maybe we need to update our jokes a little bit. So let's see if we can find some new habits, some new mannerisms, some new things that we can collectively laugh at. So I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but boy howdy, we are going to do it. Don't forget to drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. If you do want to see some bonus content, you can either become a channel member or join the Patreon. All the links will be in the description below. With all of that being said, let's do this. <music> Gracious. Well, I don't know about you, but we've certainly enjoyed a banquet of rich dishes just to, on this opening day of our convention. Wouldn't you agree? This is one of those JW catchphrases that sticks with people and really annoys me. And I've even heard some other people that are in the XJW community use it, where they say, wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? And it's like the the JW <laughs> the the Jehovah's Witness can leave Watchtower, but the Watchtower doesn't leave the Jehovah's Witness. So when I heard this, it immediately just like err because I get so annoyed whenever I hear people say this. Wouldn't you agree? Is that a real question? Because you are the one that's clapping. Wouldn't you agree? Well, ask me the question, do you agree with me? No, no, I don't agree with you. But that's not what they want. They want a group mind think. They want everyone to agree with them because no one should be asking questions. No one can be critical of their opinions. No one can say, no, I don't actually agree with you because then they're shouted down and they get other people to shout down that di the dissension. In, in the group because they have to harbor a group think in order to keep the cult alive. I'd like to start by asking you to think back on a long, cold, snowy winter. It's gonna be cold, it's gonna be gray, and it's gonna last you for the rest of your life. You might have to think back a few years because it was pretty mild this year, right? How did you feel as you were approaching the end of that long, cold, snowy winter? Tired of shoveling snow? What if spring seemed to delay a little bit? Did you get anxious? Well, what were the signs that spring started to appear? The temperatures started to rise. The days started to get longer. The songbirds returned. The cherry blossoms sprouted. 
Tulips and crocuses started popping up through the soil. Maybe your allergies started to kick in. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I promise his whole talk isn't this bad because he is doing the quintessential elders voice for those that have been around the channel for a while or have seen a lot of the skits i do i have a character that uh talks that does the elder speak where he talks basically like this and we can learn so many wonderful things when we contemplate god's creation and appreciate love that he has given all of <laughs> it's so hard to do for a long time but this intro like if you guys saw the, like in the timeline you see the waveform it's called like you see like when people are not, when it's silent it's just like a little tiny thing big pause little tiny thing big pause it's so annoying but i promise his whole talk isn't like this but man what a absolute stinky winky way to begin a talk. Everyone is going to be asleep like, ooh, new governing body member. But what if spring seemed to delay? How did you feel? Did you write it off and say, well, I guess we're not going to have spring this year. Just go straight into autumn and winter again. They're not going to laugh anymore. No, we knew it was coming. We knew it was going to be here. We just had to wait a little bit longer. And that's what we did. We waited patiently. Well, what about the end of this system of things? How long have you been waiting? Okay, time for a little cult mentality 101. If you want to start a cult or if you've been in a cult and want to understand some of the things that went into that, uh, I got a good one for you. They take something familiar, something that you know, like the seasons. Spring always happens, summer, when it always happens. They take something that you know and try and insert themselves in there as if it's the same thing. I, I'm sure that's where we're going here. We haven't gotten there yet, but that is, rest assured, that's where we're going. So it's just like waiting for the end of the system of things. No, it's not, because guess what? I, for every year of my life, have experienced, I have witnessed, I have seen evidence for springtime, and I have never seen evidence. I have never witnessed the end of the world. The illustration makes no sense because they're not the same. You can't take what you know and say, well, because you have confidence in this thing that you know, you should also have confidence in this thing that you don't know. No, that's not how it works. It's like, well, the last uh, three people I dated, none of them ever cheated on me, so therefore I shouldn't assume the next person or I shouldn't assume that the next person I date will never cheat on me. That could never happen. Well, no, you should still have a healthy, like, skepticism, I suppose, at some point until you get to the point in your relationship where you do genuinely trust each other. It shouldn't be automatic. It's so freaking stupid. It, it, this goes for so many different things in life. So uh, if we're trying to get out of our, ex, our Jehovah's Witness mindset, uh, be aware of the people that take these things that are familiar, things that you know are true, and use it as some sort of clever, cute illustration for something completely unknown. Also, for something completely unknown that they don't offer evidence for, that they have no proof for, and is also demonstrably false or wrong whenever you go past just their words, and you dig a little deeper and you see they were lying the entire time. Help me! Help me! How long have you been waiting? Do you want to know when the end is coming? Me too. <laughs> but that puts us in good company with Jesus' apostles. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. They asked the same question. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your presence and of the conclusion of the system of things? What was Jesus' reply? 
I invite you to turn to Matthew chapters 24 and 25. You might like to put a marker there. We're going to spend some time in that this afternoon, those two chapters. But let's focus on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. This is annoying. You claim to be a spokesperson for God, God's mouthpiece, if you will, the only channel through which God disseminates spiritual food to the entire human population. And yet you think you can casually just laugh and say, ah, ha, 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 I wish I knew when the end was coming as well. Bro, you and your clown friends absolutely tell people you know when the end is coming. You say, well, it'll be, I mean, not the exact day, but you at least say it'll be in this generation. It's a historic thing with Watchtower. They always have a timeline because if you're a doomsday cult, you can't just say, well, we don't really know, no pressure, Who? it could be 50 years from now, it could be 10 years from now, we don't really know. But we need people to think that it could be right around the corner. So we're in the last part of the last part of the last part of the last days, blah, blah, blah. This generation, this generation. I know I talk about it a lot, but it's important because you cannot trust people like this. This guy is a con artist, and I think he has actually bought into his own con. Now that he has become a governing body member, he now is part of the whole con. He's had all of the books opened up to him. He gets to see behind the curtain and know it's a bunch of horseradish. And yet, he still wants you to eat this dubious spiritual food. Shoutouts to my anyone that got that reference. Uh, if you play Zelda, you'll know what I'm talking about. But it's so ridiculous when you have a guy talking like, well, I, hey, I would too. I mean, I also claim that I know it's coming in this time period, but I don't know the day, so it's all good. Let's just slap our knee and laugh about it. No. Yes, Jehovah has set the day on his calendar. And as much as we would like to, we can't calculate when the end is going to come, the specific day and hour. Now, you can imagine what was going on in Peter's brain at that moment. Wait, the sun does not know the day or the hour? Wait, Jesus, you're you're the sun. You don't know the day or the hour? Well, we know that Jesus knows the day and the hour at this time. He is the king of God's kingdom. He knows when he's going to execute Jehovah's judgment on this system of things. But what else did Jesus say in this teaching session that we find recorded in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. Well, instead of a calculation, he gave a two-part reply. First, he provided a composite sign of the characteristics that would mark the end of this system of things. His followers would have to pay attention to all aspects of those signs. And second, he related three parables. Now, we don't often hear the word parable, so it's essentially a short story that teaches a valuable lesson. Well, what are the lessons in these three parables found in Matthew chapter 25? Now, I did say we would give him a fair chance and listen to his whole talk. Yes, we will do it, but I didn't say that we would listen in real time. So we might speed up a few things here and there, but just a quick question that I often get a little bit uh, confused by, and that is, if he's not going to give the date, why give the sign? Especially if said sign is applicable at almost any time in history. You could just plop yourself into anywhere on the old timeline and you'll probably be able to work out uh, things that would fit the signs that Jesus gave. Uh, As most of you guys know, I'm not a Christian myself, so maybe I've gotten this completely wrong, or maybe I've missed the mark entirely, and excuse me for that, but it just has always struck me as odd why he wouldn't give a date. So he doesn't want people to know the exact date or to live for that date but then to give a sign that's kind of blurry. Why not give a sign that is concrete, absolutely clear? You wouldn't know the exact time, but it could be, here's the country, here's the president, here's all of these things, so that way it makes perfect sense. But by having a blurry sign, it's kind of, is this really your exit? Imagine if you were trying to use Google Maps like you would the Bible here, or, or this these parables. And it's like, is this the real sign of your exit? Are you sure this is where you want to turn off? It would be very frustrating, and it would lead to a lot of confusion. So it's just never made a lot of sense to me, even when I was a believer, but even more so now that I'm not. 
And there's something that we want to keep in mind as we consider all of these parables. Where did they come from? They came from Jesus, who is now the head of the Christian congregation. He knows when the end is going to come, and he's trying to prepare us for the end of this system of things. Now, this point is of note because, if you remember, there was a recent talk where they said listening to the governing body is basically the same as listening to Jesus. So, where does all these things come from? They come from Jesus. You see how everything gets intertwined and kerfuffled around? It's not only annoying, but it's slightly insidious how they weave all of these things together where they basically make themselves into gods on earth, and yet at the beginning, ha ha, hey, I'm, I'm just like you, man. I don't know when the end is going to come, but also I'm basically Jesus Christ. Now hand over your money. In the parable of the virgins, the bridegroom is Jesus, and the virgins are his anointed followers. Jesus gave this parable to admonish all his anointed followers in the last days to keep on the watch, lest they miss out on their precious reward. So what is the lesson of the parable? Nothing. Well, the parallel account in Mark 13 provides some insight. Mark 13, verse 37 Jesus said, but what I say to you, in other words, what I say to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, I say to all, keep on the watch. So it wasn't simply to the anointed, it was also to the other sheep. The other sheep, too, must heed this lesson. Yes, this parable is counsel and a warning to all of Christ's followers. But how can we apply the lesson on staying watchful? Well, we need to strengthen our conviction that the end is truly near. If I were to ask you what convinces you that we're close to the end, how would you respond? This is actually pretty interesting to me because it really highlights what it was like being in a doomsday cult. Because I would have given my evidence to other fellow believers and everyone would have said, yes, I agree with you. But every time I tried to give that evidence to someone that wasn't already a believer, they looked at me funny. They said, baby pandas, thousand year reign, Armageddon. Huh? What, what are you talking about, weird man? And that's important because Watchtower needs people to be part of this hive mind. That is what it means to be in a doomsday cult. If you're watching this video and you were a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, you were part of a group think hive mind. You were a zombie. The reason I woke up was because I looked out at the audience from the stage of people singing, listen, obey, and be blessed. And it was terrifying. It was terrifying to put down my songbook. Well, I think I was using a tablet at the time, but it's all the same. And I just looked at people and I saw them. It was terrifying, but this is the mental state of most Jehovah's Witnesses. What is the proof that we are living in the last days? The real question people should be asking if you are a Jehovah's Witness, go out and prove to someone that doesn't already believe, show them the evidence. How would you prove to someone else outside of the religion that we are living in the last days? And then how many people are convinced by that? Because as we know, the preaching work is not very effective. So no one's being convinced of this. The evidence might be a little bit shaky. So I just found this little tiny, maybe I'm just weird and I find interesting things in the small details, but I think it really, all of these things do really lie in the small details. Anyway, I'm rambling, let's move on. And I'm definitely not wearing a different shirt because I definitely didn't have to take a break from watching this talk because I definitely didn't regret having said I was going to watch this whole thing in the entirety. None of that happened. Uh, for instance, maybe you're thinking of 1 
2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, the characteristics that would mark the last days. And that's true. People have no natural affection. They're without self-control. They're fierce. Road rage is angrier than ever. People have a short fuse and explode with very little provocation. Just recently, my wife Nadia and I were stopped at a red light and observed two drivers having a shouting match full of obscenities. We were happy that we weren't in the mix and that neither of them had a gun. But that is becoming commonplace in today's world. As someone that used to be a Jehovah's Witness, he had a free opportunity to get the audience involved in a very emotional story because I hear of these road rage incidents, which are absolutely horrible, uh, almost like every other day where people are just whipping out guns over the dumbest things, like absolute scum of the earth human beings that take another person's life for cutting them off or something like Y'all need to relax when you're behind the wheel of a car. It's going to be fine. You're going to get to your destination. Anyway, it's one of my pet peeves. I road rage and people that speed and drive like maniacs. I can't get my head around it. But he had a perfect opportunity. But it kind of demonstrated to me that maybe because he's a member of the governing body now, he's the main character in all of his narratives at this point. So he just gives us this... Hey, these two people were shouting obscenities. You wouldn't believe it. One guy rolled down his window and said, you son of a bitch. And the other guy rolled down his window and said, go to hell. And me and my wife were started praying to, like, you could have had a much more engaging story other than two people just yelling obscenities at each other. It's just my personal opinion there, but maybe he has a little bit of the uh, main character syndrome now that he is a member of the governing body. I guess now that I think about it, maybe I have some main character syndrome. Look at me, me, me. It's all about me. What about another uh, evidence that we're living close to the end? We're living in the time period symbolized by the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's dream image, the Anglo-American world power. I don't understand the words you just said. Other nations may challenge it, but it will not be replaced according to Bible prophecy. That's amazing when we think about it and we look at what's happening on the world scene today. These guys never cease to just crack me up. They have this insatiable desire to be completely stupid and can think that their audience is just as dumb as they are. This isn't a mind-blowing fact because new light is ever present. Everything is always subject to change with them. So when he talks about, oh, wow, it's amazing and we know that we're at the end because this is happening in the world scene... They've gotten those things wrong in the past. It's, they, they keep getting it wrong, just like ZZ keeps scratching me in the butt. ZZ, for the love of God, stop. Here, go chase your toy. Ch get, just get it. Okay, go wild, hog wild. Uh, okay, and then just come up here and you can grab it and then be gone with you. But whenever, like the king of the north and king of the south, that has changed continually throughout the years within the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. So why would it be incredible? Why would it be amazing to look at this thing that if it's wrong, they'll just change it? The, and everyone in the audience probably understands that. It's like, how many goddamn times are we going to have to listen to them talk about some prophecy and how it's evidence? And guess what? My grandmother said that, and she believed something completely different, and then they just changed it. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that he can get up and with a smile say, this, <laughs> this is evidence. Another evidence, Matthew 24, 14. You know those words by heart. The global preaching work is being accomplished. Well, what comes after the good news of the kingdom is preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations? Anyone? Anyone? The Great Depression passed the... Anyone? Anyone? And then the end will come. 
Never before has the preaching work taken such global dimensions, reached into the very corners of the earth. Someone in the comments will have to correct me on this most likely, but wasn't there in like 2015 this guy, uh, like a school teacher in Texas, that worked out that there was more people living inside of this circle than outside of it. And the circle represented like India and China and Malaysia, uh, basically like in the South China area. And it only represented about like 6% of the world. And yet more like 50%, more than 50% of the people in the entire population of the globe lived inside of that small area. Uh, I can't remember. It's called like the Valeprius, Val Valeprius, Valanchunas, Jonas Valanchunas. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, but I think it was even verified by someone in the UN as well. But anyway, my point of saying all of this is Watchtower does not have a lot of representation in China and in India. And if you really think about it, the the reach of Watchtower doesn't actually span even half of the population of the world. When, when you actually look at the numbers and where they have been successful and where they do their preaching work, you can't say that they have preached to the most distant parts of the earth. They don't really have members in the majority of the world. They're not really making a big dent in India, in China, or in the Middle East. There are a lot of people there. So this claim that they are preaching in the most distant parts of the earth, yeah, maybe they're preaching in some unique language that hardly anyone speaks, and they're producing literature in that. And that's super cool, especially if it's helping different communities that haven't had access to learning tools uh, in order to learn how to read and write and stuff. Obviously, there's a problem when it comes to that coming at the cost of indoctrinating them to, to a bunch of horseradish. But I, I think it's not like the worst thing Watchtower has ever done is like helping people learn how to read and write. Uh, I think most of us would be able to agree about that. But I think it's just funny how they make this claim, how the preaching work is being done across the entire globe, when it's just simply not true, because they've barely tapped half of it. Now, what motivation, what should that motivate us to do? Well, in harmony with the prophecy, or Jesus' parable, I should say, we have to realize that no one else can keep on the watch for us. It's something personal. We have to keep alert to the world scenes. The foolish virgins asked the discreet ones to give up some of their oil, but it was too late. The groom arrived and caught the foolish ones off guard. Well, we show by our decisions and life course whether or not we personally are keeping on the watch. We might ask ourselves, am I prepared and ready? If the Great Tribulation suddenly began tomorrow, would I be ready? Is my relationship with Jehovah where it needs to be for salvation? Would Jehovah view me as being marked for survival? Have I strengthened my trust in Jehovah? What are my priorities? This is one of the scariest things if you're a Jehovah's Witness. This question right here. Would I be ready if Armageddon came tomorrow? And I remember there being like big, this is probably so common amongst Jehovah's Witnesses, but a big thunderstorm or dark clouds or something. And just seeing like a thunderstorm would make my brain think about every sin I ever committed, every, every song with a swear word in it, uh, how I was a bad person, every time I masturbated how that made me evil and I didn't confess my sins to the elders and then ZZ started biting me again. Why? You are not gonna make it through the Great Tribulation. You won't make it. You've committed too many sins against humanity, against YouTube, against me. I've raised you since you were a, like a half a pound and this is how you treat me? Children, am I right? But anyway, it's so terrifying because that question Whenever it pops up in your mind, like when he says that to the audience, every sin that they have committed but not confessed to the elders is now at the forefront of everyone in the audience. Everyone that's hearing this is immediately scared because they know they have not been a perfect Jehovah's Witness. Because let's face it, most, I mean, 99% of witnesses aren't perfect witnesses and don't follow every single rule that Watchtower has. So just go. go chase your toy. And when he says this, it will strike fear into everyone. And I, just hearing it, just, just when he said that, 
are we ready for the Great Tribulation? It still made me have all of those feelings of the constant fear, anxiety, and stress that you have when you're a Jehovah's Witness, wanting to make sure that you are going to survive the great day of Jehovah Almighty. Am I trying to squeeze as much as I can out of this system of things before it goes down? Or are my interests on storing up treasures in heaven? Our focus now should be getting out of the danger zone. Being on Jehovah's side so that when destruction comes, we will be among the survivors. We avoid vain works. It's like building a sandcastle where it would be washed away. We want to avoid that type of vain works. Instead of focusing or investing in this system of things, we focus and invest in Jehovah's kingdom. And this is coming from an organization that is actively investing in Satan's system of things, in these vain pursuits. <laughs> what are we listening to? This is the classic, do as I say, not as I do. Judge me by my words, not my actions. You know, judge me on my words. <laughs> But I am trying to look into why a lot of the community are so uh, angry. And I suppose when you say, judge me by my words, they, they might respond, judge me, well, I'll judge you by your actions. <laughs> like, imagine, you, you, you're speeding. You know you're speeding, you're going 50 at a 25. The cop pulls you over and he says, hey, how fast are you going? And he says, hey, I actually wasn't going dangerously fast. I think you should judge me by my words, not my actions. He's like, here, bucko, here's your ticket. Like, what? that's not how the world works. Like, if, if a parent is, like, beating their child with a baseball bat and saying, hey, I'm doing this out of love. No, you're not doing it out of love. We don't judge people by their words. We judge them by their actions. And if people say, hey, just judge me by my words. Don't look at my actions. That should be a massive red flag that mm, maybe you do need to be judging them by their actions. The faithful Christian's dependable. He or she will be regular in the ministry each month. But the Christian who is good goes above and beyond just being regular in the ministry. For instance, maybe we have specific scheduled times when we go out. We're faithful every Saturday. But what happens if we're in a grocery store line and someone starts talking about world conditions? Are we inclined to speak up? Well, the good slave would do so, wanting to share the good news with as many as possible. And Jesus, as the master, appreciates that. How might we expand our ministry? What are some ways? How will you make the best use of your strength and energy? Maybe it's by pioneering. Maybe it's by attending a theocratic school. Maybe it's by volunteering for Bethel service. We were encouraged to do that earlier in our program today. And, and parents, you have a wonderful opportunity to help your children to pursue spiritual goals as well. Take advantage of that opportunity. I guess to anyone that says that I might exaggerate things or blow things out of proportion, <clears throat> here's a perfect example. Now, a regular, just a good old regular Christian, they are regular in the ministry, they go out, they have their set times, but the good Christian, the one that, you know, is really guaranteed to be saved from this cataclysm that's right around the corner, they go above and beyond just their regular, normal set days. They put in that extra effort. It's just always pushing, 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 trying to squeeze as much as they can out of the lemon heads that are Jehovah's Witnesses. And they just have no, no off switch. Because you can't. Because as soon as you stop, what happens? The global pandemic was a perfect example of what happens when a Jehovah's Witness lets off the gas a little bit. They wake up in mass. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses during the pandemic all decided, this is nuts. 
I'm getting out of here because they let off the gas. And that's what Watchtower doesn't want. So you might make it through Armageddon if you're a regular witness, but if you want to guarantee your spot, you want to be a good witness, which means going above and beyond. And that means whatever plateau you've hit, no matter where you're at, you always have to be going above that anyway, right? So if you're doing eight hours a month, they're like, okay, well, I'll go above that and put in 10. They're like, well, now you're doing 10, so you got to go above that. Okay, I'll do 15. Well, you're doing 15, and you got to go above that. Okay, I'll auxiliary pioneer. Well, you got to go above that now. Oh, okay, all right. It goes on and on. It spirals and snowballs because that's just the nature of the beast that they have created. Also, quickly, before my Camry battery dies, I don't like this telling parents to push the ministry on their children because as is becoming inc increasingly apparent with a lot of the news stories that are coming out, the public ministry that Jehovah's Witnesses do isn't that safe. There are a lot of instances just within the last few months of people being hurt violently. It's not a safe place to take your children. You're putting an unnecessary risk on your children, which I think is a problem when the Watchtower knows that the public ministry presents a unnecessary risk to children, and yet they're still pushing this narrative on people. I, I think it's like a really big problem that uh, more public officials need to be aware of. But that red blinking light has got me in a worry, so let me change the camera battery. That was actually really good timing. Missed it by that much. Well, what would be the criteria for determining who are like sheep and who are like goats? Essentially, whether or not they support Christ's anointed brothers. So what does the third parable teach us? Let's watch a brief video. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, the shepherd is Jesus, and the sheep are Christians who have the hope of living forever on earth. Those Christians are judged to be sheep because they support the anointed. During last year's convention, we had some pretty interesting videos and different storylines that developed across all of the talks. What is with these videos? They're just little pictures, and he's saying the same thing that this guy's saying in his talk. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm growing very tired of this, and I'm sure most of you guys are. So we're going speed run strats. Uh, yeah, let's let's get through this thing. One eternity later. Interestingly, the anointed little flock also must heed this lesson because individually they are domestics who are fed by the faithful slave, which is a small group of Christ's brothers. Yes, the anointed too must remain loyal and feed on spiritual food provided through Jehovah's channel. Now, how can we apply the lesson on remaining loyal? In one word, obedience. Obey the faithful slave and those appointed to represent that slave, including elders in the congregation. But why should we obey? Very interestingly, Revelation chapter 14, verse 4 says that the anointed keep following the Lamb, Christ Jesus, no matter where he goes. So if the faithful slave follows the Lamb, then the direction, the guidance that they provide is Bible-based. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we received very pointed direction from the faithful slave. It tested our obedience, our loyalty, but the direction was motivated by love and respect for life. And what were the results? It saved thousands of lives. Just as Christ has affection for the congregation, so too does the governing body. We love you. The governing body prays constantly for the worldwide brotherhood. You want to survive? 
and impending fireballs from heaven, lightning blasting people in the streets? You better shut up and listen to me. Ima imagine if, like, I came onto this channel and was some sort of charlatan that was trying to bilk people of their money. And that was the message I had. Listen to me or die. Ob obey me. Obedience to me is the thing that will save your life. What are you talking about? What in tarnation? It, uh, six months ago, you were one of these domestics. This dude has main character syndrome now. I'm actually looking forward to now his future talks because if he has the coconuts to talk in this way this early on since his appointment to the governing body, I, boy howdy, what is it going to be in a few months from now? But man, is it scary. It's so scary to think that people that I know people that I care about or have cared about in the past are just going to drink this up like a cup of coffee in the morning and be recharged spiritually, re-energized to keep following the governing body. And the governing body cares about you. They love you. I mean, I can't really point to any particular instances. I can't point to anything tangible that demonstrates, that is evidence. I can't show you anything that says the governing body loves and cares about you, but I can say it. O of all of the times when he's like, now, here's evidence of this. When he says this, he doesn't point to anything. He just says it. The governing body loves you. There you go. Pat you on the bottom. Now write us a check. It's not like they can point to, well, look at all of the humanitarian aid that we do. Because people are, will be sitting there looking at themselves, like, at each other, like, uh, we asked the elders, we asked, we wrote letters to the branch begging for help because we were under financial struggles. And they said, we'll pray for you, Jehovah will provide. And then we lost everything. It, it, it's, it's easy to say. The governing body loves you. We love you. I love you. It just, the words just fly out of people's mouths. But where's the action? How can you, I would rather someone know it. Have, like, it be undeniable to them how much you care about them because of the actions you take on a day-to-day -day basis. Prove by your actions. Don't just throw the words out there, you freaking bozo. So obedience is necessary for loyalty. But another way is to support the work of Jehovah's organization. How? Well, the small group of anointed ones can't possibly complete the preaching work on their own. That's where we need your support. We need your help in this preaching activity. Then there's also the constructing of kingdom halls, assembly halls, places of worship, branch facilities used in Jehovah's service and also donating to the worldwide work. Here's an experience from Mexico. A little girl we'll call Laura, age six, lives in Mexico. Sadly, she suffers from epilepsy. And after one particularly difficult hospital visit, her older sister gave her a piggy bank as a gift. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Laura received money from her family to use for school or to buy treats. And what did she do with the money? She decided to save the money in her piggy bank, depositing it there. Well, when in-person meetings resumed, Laura brought her piggy bank to the kingdom hall. What did she do with it? Well, after the meeting, she broke it open, counted the money she saved, and it totaled 350 pesos, or about 17 United States dollars. She contributed the entire amount giving half to support the local congregation and the other half to the worldwide work. Laura explained, I wanted to donate my savings for our brothers to use and to send more brothers to preach in foreign lands. Think about it. All of this was going through the mind of a six-year-old. She also asked for another piggy bank, of course, so that she could start saving once again. But that's not all. 
She's trying to learn to read and write so that she personally can share the good news with others. She can tell others about her loving God, Jehovah. By her actions, that little girl is essentially gathering at Jesus' right hand among the sheep. She's precious to Jehovah. She's precious to Jesus. She's precious to each one of us here in attendance. I've been pretty good lately about not swearing on the channel, trying to remain brand friendly, all of the good stuff. Uh, so here's just a fair warning uh, for anyone that might be offended at uh, the obscenities language. But uh, yeah, maybe just skip ahead until you see the governing body member talking again. Because I got some stuff to say, and I don't really feel like holding back. Maybe it's because I've been watching this talk for so long. But boy, oh boy, there's your warning. And now I will have my, my two cents in the old piggy bank here. You horrible, stupid mother <laughs> How can you point to a sick six-year-old girl collecting money for treats and hospital visits? How can you point to that and be proud of yourself? for taking her money. You know how much money and assets the, the governing body control. You're, you're part of the group now. You don't have any excuses. You know exactly the financial situation of Watchtower. You know how many kingdom halls that they own, that they sell, that they tell people, hey, just go drive. And yet, like the little <laughs> weasel that you are, you want to beat your chest and say, look at me. I'm the biggest head in the world because guess what? I steal from a six year old. This is so sad. That is so pathetic. This guy that doesn't have to worry about money for the rest of his life, ostensibly. He has got it made. He lives in a compound. He gets to fly first class around the world. He gets green handshakes wherever he goes from rich witnesses. He just, all he has to do is give some talks and go to some Wednesday meetings. I can't imagine governing body members are putting in that much work. And for him to be happy and say, hey, look at this. Look at this person. They don't have anything. They, they sacrifice their treat money. They sacrifice the people that gave her that money. Do you think that they were like, man, we're giving you this money so that way you can give it to a billion dollar real estate company. Do you think that they would like it? Put that on your GoFundMe. Put that on your GoFundMe. Hey, Please donate to this little girl who has medical conditions and is having trouble, you know, paying for the hospital bills or whatever the case might be, and then go f yourself because she's going to turn around and break the piggy. She even breaks the piggy bank, which was also a gift. So that way she can give $17 to Watchtower, 17 clams to, to a billion dollar real estate company. What? the hell is going on in the collective minds of the governing body that thought that this was a good idea what in tarnation has like the biggest stupid beam of all time has blasted them in the heads and said hey during this convention i think we should tell uh the audience about a six-year-old that has serious medical conditions but she still wanted to give her money. And then also later on, let us show a drama about African refugees that have been displaced from their homes, from their family, from everything. And we'll have a donation box set up outside of that. You governing body members, whoever at Bethel is so down on the totem pole that they are charged with watching apostate propaganda to see what we're saying about the organization. Honestly, and I mean this genuinely from the bottom of my heart, like 
my balls fill with rage when I when I say this. I could not be more enthusiastic and genuine when I say you are disgusting. I I it brings me to tears, it makes me angry, it makes me want to break things. This organization is so disgusting. Anyway, there was a good rant for you. I think you've made your point. Well, during the fast past few months, while visiting family, I've had a chance to watch both literal sheep and goats. I've observed some very interesting things. Uh, for instance, sheep are somewhat shy creatures. Uh, they didn't even want me to take a photo of them. They were docile, protective of their young, helpless and fearful without a shepherd. What about goats? Well, goats are a little different. Recently, my three-year-old ne little nephew was feeding carrots to a few goats through a wooden fence. And he had a little plastic Ziploc bag full of carrots that was on the ground. He would grab one carrot from the plastic bag. He would feed it to the goat, grab another carrot, feed it to the goat. Well, he decided that he wanted to make that a little quicker. So he grabbed the plastic bag full of carrots. What did the goat do? It reached through the fence, grabbed the whole bag. The next thing we had goats fighting over the carrots. Carrots were everywhere. What did the goat finally do? The goat ate the carrots, but it also even ate the plastic bag. What's the moral of the story? I don't know. Don't let a young child feed a wild animal without supervision? Don't be a goat. Goats are independent. They're self-serving. At times, they'll even eat garbage. Well, if we want to please Jehovah God and Christ, we need to be sheep-like, humble, loyal, willing to be led by the shepherd. And how do we benefit by remaining loyal? I need everyone to spit out your chewing gum, get your pencil and paper out, because class is in session and I'm here to teach you guys a lesson. Humility is not saying you have all of the answers in the entire universe there is a 0% chance you could ever be wrong about any of it, and you are part of a select group of people that is going to survive Armageddon, which is going to kill 99.9% .9 of the human population, and you are the special 0.1%. That is not humility. Being able to accept that you might be wrong, being willing to hear other arguments, being willing to respect someone else that has a differing point of view from you, that's humility. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses are the most arrogant people, some of the most arrogant people on planet Earth. They think that everyone else is wrong, that they haven't tapped into the mainframe, that everyone else is stupid, and they are the ones that have found the true cheat code to life. That's not humility. They're arrogant people. And when you get out of the watchtower, when you get out of that control, you can think for yourself, good, positive, but you can also be open-minded. You can be open to people challenging your point of view. If you get vehemently angry and want to shout down, or if you experience other people in the ex-Jehovah's Witness community that just want to shout down your point of view, that want to call you names and, and block you on social media or remove your comment from YouTube because, oh, why would you ever disagree with me? Guess what? They're still trapped in the mindset of being a Jehovah's Witness. I hate to throw the cold water on your face, but open-mindedness, being willing to respect someone even if you disagree with them, being willing to engage with someone and see their point of view, having a rational, respectful discussion, that is all part of the growing process of leaving the Jehovah's Witness mindset and leaving Watchtower behind you and moving on with your life. 
And this is a prime example, I think, of why I even make YouTube videos, is because we were programmed to think in this way. We were programmed to think that humility was being able to plug your ears and close your eyes and say, I know what's right and I don't want to hear anyone. I don't want to see any evidence. I don't want to hear anything or be around anybody that disagrees with me. Class dismissed. Well, there are benefits now. Loyal obedience brings us joy. That means contentment, security, brings joy to those taking the lead among us. And what about later? Those who remain loyal to Christ, brothers, will gain something special. Notice what we find Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. There, to conclude the illustration, Jesus said, These will depart into everlasting cutting off, referring to the goats, but the righteous ones, the sheep, into everlasting life. What is everlasting life? It's hard to quantify it, what that means. To what might we compare it? It's like the sun rising every morning, constantly there. Everlasting life is just like that. Your life will never end, constant. You know, I think I was completely wrong about this guy. I, I see what Jesus saw. Jesus was up in heaven with his big old binoculars, looking and scouring the earth, trying to find who would be a good representation of him and his ideals, who would be an eloquent speaker that could bring people into the organization that he approved in 1919. And he looked down and saw this guy. What's everlasting life? Well... It'd be hard to quantify, you know, um, it's, uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the sun rising. It's just always there. And then it sets and then it rises and then it sets. So that's everlasting life. It makes sense now. Eternity is such a hard concept for humans to grasp, but I don't think I have ever heard anyone put it in such a bland, boring, nonsensical way as this. Let's, what, what, what illustration could we use that would better illustrate that? Uh, I don't know. A jellyfish. As far as we know, talk about a jellyfish and how it basically is immortal. There are jellyfish that scientists have found that are essentially, they never die. Why don't you talk about that? That would be way more interesting than just the sun rising. At least it's something that people could get their heads around, like, wait, there's an animal that exists that essentially never dies if it doesn't get eaten by a predator? Whoa, I can get my head, wow, that's amazing. I could do that too. At least it's life on Earth that's relatable, not <laughs> something millions of miles away that keeps us warm. Holy, this guy is the worst. Oh wait, sorry, he's not the worst, he's great. I see what Jesus saw in him. But what is accomplished by our not knowing the day or the hour? Absolutely nothing. And that ends this talk. We have finished day one Friday of the convention. Shout outs to you. High fives all around. I hope you guys enjoyed the videos. I tried to spice them up and make them as fun as possible. I know sometimes they can get a little bit dry, but you know, we did it. And I hope you guys do appreciate and appreciate it and all of that good stuff. Uh, never again will I try and commit to having an entire talk because boy oh boy this video is going to be very long and who knows maybe in editing I'll even cut some of it out because it's just a lot of me ranting and this guy talking but you know what we did it for science we did it to honestly I don't even really know why we did it Oh wait, yeah, that was the whole reason. To establish whether or not he was a good speaker or he's interesting, uh, no. The answer is no, he's not. He's terrible, he's awful, he's boring. I mean, just look at his tie. It's just brown with a brown pocket square. Like, it's straight out of like 2003. Awful. Anyway, enough about this bozo. Uh, you've seen enough of this bozo. Not enough of this cool guy. But uh, yeah, if you're still around, don't forget to drop a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel. And I guess uh, after the weekend, we will move headlong into the Saturday program. So buckle up, stay safe, be kind, don't have road rage, and don't forget to smile. It's actually really funny. Um, there's a person at Costco that 
has started saying you better have a good ass day because I started saying it to her and she always like talks about my nails or whatever. And uh, anyway, so now the last time I was at Costco, she told me, she was like, hey, you better have a good ass day. And it really made me laugh. Anyway, that's all I got. Bye. Because everybody's heard that the bird is the word. Bird, 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 bird. The bird's a word. Bird, 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 bird.